So where we're going to camp out for the rest of the semester is the skull, facial bones. Um, there's going to be a lot of redundancy. A lot of the projections that we're going to cover today, we'll cover in, in separate sections as well. Uh, frontal bone, we're going to have to see the frontal bone multiple times. The uh, parietal bones, not so much, but we'll see the parietal bones projected onto different things. Um, temporal bones, we'll, we'll talk about a few different times. But the uh, really some aspects of the temporal bone we're going to use for analysis for pretty much every image that we're going to take of the, the skull. Uh, but some of the projections we're going to cover over and over and over again. Um, and we'll talk about those as we get to them. Um, <clears throat> understand that, that in this semester, if you look on page two of uh, second edition of Merrill's, um, you'll see that there's a method attached to a lot of the different uh, projections that we're gonna take. A lot of the different positions are gonna come with a, a method as well. So um, we'll talk about how to identify those as we go through, you know, there's Caldwell, reverse Caldwell, there's Towns, there's Haas, um, which are really opposites of each other. And if you look, there are some uh, that are used uh, in multiple places, multiple uh, exam types. There's Waters over and over again, there's Towns over and over again, uh, modified Towns and, and so forth. So uh, Schuler's is one that, that is not listed a lot, but um, it, <coughs> there are multiple Schulers that, that we'll talk about as well. So what we're going to talk about today primarily is going to be anatomy, uh, in this first section anyways, primarily going to be anatomy. Um, there, on this next test, it's, uh, it's kind of a large test. It's like 140 questions or something like that, but a lot of that is labeling, um, and a lot of the labeling comes from the pictures that are in Merrill. So uh, you're going to want to benchmark those or earmark those rather, um, and uh, you know, study the, the diagrams. And I'll, I'll try to point out which ones are gonna be on there, but certainly the one on, on page three is gonna be there. So we'll get to that in just a second. So in the skull, we divide the skull into a couple of different portions. That would be cranial bones, and that would be the, the skull proper, what we think of when we, we're talking about the skull itself, uh, what contains the brain. And then we got the facial bones. So we're gonna break the facial bones into separate sections, like we'll do mandible, uh, TMJ, in one section we'll do uh, the rest of the facial bones in a different section as well. Uh, we'll also do sinuses in a different section, which the sinuses are contained primarily into the, in the uh, cranial bones, but we'll talk about them separately. So in the, the cranial bones, further we're gonna break them down into the calvaria and the floor. So the calvaria being kind of the dome of the skull, and then we've got the floor um, as well, so, uh, you know, kind of what some people refer to as a brain pan. Um, <clears throat> this is where you might see all the way through the registry and just follow it away. I'm, I'm not going to use that in class so much, but uh, diplo would be a, a type of bone where you've got uh, kind of two plates with spongy bone in between them. That's the construction of the skull bones. The skull bones uh, are relatively, even though they're, they're kind of curved, they're, they're really kind of flat. Um, and then you've got that goo in between. So it's, it's just the, the way the skull bones created. And they look like this. All right, so what we've got is the bone right up front is what we call the frontal bone. It's the one in front, right. So you've got two bones that, that make up the majority of the side of the head. So you've got what we call the parietal bones, which is the upper portion of the bone. And then we've got the uh, temporal bone being the lower portion. So temporal bone, you know, think about, uh, what does that sound like? Um, temporal, temporal, right? So I, that's where you've got some connection, but um, tympanic membrane uh, is, you know, a portion of the, that's your eardrum, right? So that's gonna be found inside the temporal bone. We'll talk about the features of the temporal bone. And again, uh, an awful lot of, of what we're gonna use for analysis of positioning is gonna to have to do with temporal bone, um, specific features of temporal bone. But uh, right at the temple as well, we've got the sphenoid bone that joins up to the frontal bone and the parietal bone and the temporal bone. And it goes behind the eyes, that's the sphenoid bone. Uh, so other features, you've got a, a blood vessel directly above the orbit 
and you'll hear people refer to the orbital bone. There is no such thing as an orbital bone. The orbit is created from a lot of different bones. So you got a little hole right there, and that's what we we'll call the supraorbital foramen. And what it is is uh, we refer to little holes and bones like that as nutrient foramen. So there's a blood vessel that comes through that, uh, an artery specifically that comes through that. And if you've um, ever watched you know, any kind of sport where people take repeated hits to the face, sometimes you'll see that artery break and somebody will have a, a great big uh, knot on their forehead. That's because that thing broke. So then if you look inside the, the, uh, the orbit, you'll see a couple of different things. And if I can tilt this just properly, just right, you can see some of that. So what you've got there is what we call the orbital fissures. And if I turn him just perfectly, you see that hole up here? That's optic foramen. That's the hole where the, the optic nerve goes through. And inside the skull, you can kind of see where it comes and you know, you've got that, that crossing um, so that the left eye, uh, you know, the, the um, optic nerve passes to the right-hand side of the, the uh, brain and the, and the right one passes to the left-hand side. So that's the optic um, foramen, optic canal is what we'll also refer to it as. So we've got a, a superior orbital fissure and Logically, if we're going to have a superior orbital fissure, this thing down here is probably going to be referred to as the inferior, inferior orbital fissure, right? So frontal bone. From the side, we've got a lot of stuff uh, on this that you, you're going to have to, you know, uh, highlight. So this is a, a big diagram on the test. So what we've got here is um, we've got points of interest that we have to talk about, and we've also got uh, sutures so that you need to know as well. All right, so the glabella is the knot above the bridge of your nose. So bridge of your nose right here, that's what we refer to. Um, and the knot just above it is what we refer to as the glabella. All right, so you got frontal bone, frontal bone right up front. You got the parietal bone, that's the, the upper portion of the side of the skull. Temporal bone, temporal bone again is, is uh, you know, is where our, is your ear hole is what we're gonna, we're gonna refer to as the external acoustic meatus or external auditory meatus, interchangeable. So inside of that is, is where, you know, your bones of your inner ear and your tympanic membrane live, all right? So that's inside the temporal bone. If you feel behind your ear, uh, you can feel this knot, right? If you follow right behind your ear, all the way down, you can feel this knot, and that's your mastoid process ending right there, okay? Um, that's not to be confused with the styloid process, which is in front of that. So the styloid process, I'll take this mantle off so you can see it a little bit better. The styloid process is that sharp thing right here, Oop, right there, okay? So a styloid process, mastoid process, you got muscular attachments on styloid process. All right, so the occipital bone is the bone on the back of your head, the base of the skull. You'll hear uh, people refer to uh, skull fractures, a specific skull fracture, or basilar skull fracture, involves the occipital bone. And we'll talk about the basilar skull fracture here in a bit. So you got all these bones, but they've got to be joined up together. Um, immovable sutures, sutures are immovable um, joints. So uh, babies, the bones aren't completely fused together. As you grow and your soft spots are the fontanelles, anterior and posterior fontanelles seal up, the bones grow together and create sutures. They're immovable at that point. So <clears throat> we've got sutures that join all these things together. We've got one suture that goes across the skull and it would go uh, kind of, it's, you know, it's, it doesn't go straight across the skull, but it goes kind of across the skull. So a plane that goes across your body from left to right, we refer to that as a coronal suture, right? One that goes front to back, we refer to as a sagittal suture. So sagittal suture is not shown here, but it is on the test. So if, if you see something that uh, is pointing to something, you know, just pointing you know, kind of to the back of the head. And it's not the lambda 
then you know chances are it's pointing to the sagittal suture. So sagittal suture, coronal suture are the two most obvious. But then we've got, and the, it's you know but pretty simple to to describe. So the coronal suture joins the frontal bone and parietal bones together, and the sagittal suture joins the two parietal bones together, right? But down a little bit further, um, where the, the sphenoid bone, temporal bone, frontal bone, and parietal bone together all come together, we call that the squamosal suture. Okay, so that would be that suture right across here, where the red and the blue come together. And then at the back, what we've got is what we refer to as a landoidal suture. Um, never played a fraternity or anything like that, but I do know that the triangular, kind of loosely triangular shape is the Greek letter lambda. Okay, so it's a lamboidal suture because it's kind of shaped like that. It's kind of shaped like a little bit of a, you know, weird looking triangle. So lamboidal suture is what joins the temporal bone, the, and well, the occipital bone to the temporal bone and the parietal bone. Points of interest though, what we're gonna have is up at the top where the sagittal suture and coronal suture come together, that will be referred to as the bregma. All right, and then down here, what we've got is the pterion. The P is silent, um, so P-T-E-R. Um, what other word have, have you ever seen or heard that um, starts with P-T-E-R? Big flying dinosaur. Pterodactyl. Pterodactyl, right, pterodactyl. All right, sphenoid bone, almost any, uh, okay, not anything related to the sphenoid bone is P-T-E-R, but anything that is P-T-E-R in the skull is going to refer to the sphenoid bone. And we'll take a look at that here in a minute. So sphenoid bone, where the sphenoid bone, uh, temporal bone, and the parietal bone come together at that point is referred to as a pterion. The asterion is where the, um, the mastoid, uh, I'm sorry, the, the temporal bone, the parietal bone and the, uh, the uh, occipital bone all come to a point, okay? So lambdoidal suture, where it comes to a point at the top is what we refer to as the lambda. Uh, this thing back here, um, that knot on the back of your head, if you mash it on the back of your head, you can kind of feel a knot right on the base of the skull. It's what we refer to as the external occipital protuberance, okay? Not to be confused with the EAM, uh, we're not going to abbreviate that and say EOP. Uh, we'll probably, if we refer to it as anything else, it'll be the onion. Spelled just like onion, but with an I instead of an O. Okay? So, external occipital protuberance, not on the back of your head, referred to as the onion. Okay? Bregma, asterion, lambda, pterion, um, and all the sutures. Okay? Okay, so cranial bones, again, we've got the upper portion, we've got the frontal bone, the occipital bone, the parietal bones, and then the floor uh, is formed, and they're really on the inside, by the ethmoid, the sphenoid, uh, the right temporal and left temporal bones. And we'll take a look at that here. All right, so a lot of stuff on this one as well. Okay, so we'll just kind of take it around, uh, hitting the, the main points going clockwise. So this thing right here is actually the very upper portion of the ethmoid bone. So if we look back inside of this thing here, you see the blue frontal bone, right? And then you've got this thing that sticks up out of the top, that green portion, everybody can see that? Okay, that's what that thing is. It's the very top of the ethmoid bone, and that's what we call the crista galli. So that's that thing right there. It's just a point out of the, the top of the, uh, the frontal bone. Okay, so it, uh, it rises up from the cribriform plate, which is kind of the horizontal portion of that, uh, to form this little point right there, okay? So again, we got the optic canal. You can't really see the optic canal because it's behind this thing right here. So uh, what we've got is, in this thing, is what we refer to as the cella tersica. The cella tersica is uh, Latin for Turkish saddle. Um, and you'll take a look at this and from a, a lateral aspect here in a minute. It kind of looks like a saddle, okay? So we'll take a look at that here in a bit. Um, in the cella tersica, we've got a number of different things that we have to remember. Uh, so we've got anterior clinoid processes. Anterior clinoid processes in these things, all right? So I wish these were color-coded the same. They're not, so we just got to deal with it. 
See these two little brown points right there? Okay, those are the anterior clinoid processes. Again, logically, if you have anterior clinoid processes, you're also going to have posterior. posterior clinoid processes. They're more subtle. It's those two little points right there. Okay, and I can pass this around here in just a minute and you can kind of get a look at all this stuff. So posterior clinoid processes, these two little things right there. What sits inside of that Turkish saddle, the cell turcica, is your pituitary gland. All right, so it just sits in this, you know, little U-shaped thing if you look at it from a lateral aspect, which we will here in a bit. So uh, that's your cell turcica. The um, <coughs> Anterior portion of the inside is what we call a tuberculum cella. The outer portion going down the back is what we refer to as the dorsum cella, you know, as, as opposed to anterior or ventral, you got dorsal, right? So dorsum cella, and then uh, the, the line that would run from the posterior portion of your cella tercica all the way down into this big hole right here, which is what we refer to as the foramen magnum, is what we refer to as the clivus. All right, so uh, last semester when we went through spines, you remember talking about the clivus and it should point directly to the, the peak of the odontoid process. It's been a minute, right? But that's what that is, is clivus. All right, so anterior, posterior, clinoid process, uh, foramen, 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 Foramen lacerum, uh, the dorsum cell is back, back portion. That's your jugular foramen. Um, your foramen magnum is big hole. That's a big hole in your skull. Occipital bone is here. Your clivus, we already mentioned. And this is the, the what we're going to camp out on a, quite a bit this semester is the petrous portion or the petrous ridges or what they'll refer to as petrous pyramids. Um, almost every view of the skull and the evaluation criteria, it's going to mention the position of the petrous ridges, okay? Petrous ridges are the most dense portion, most dense feature of the skull, all right? So you can see them very easily. So coming back around, we've got the temporal bone here, uh, foramen spinosum, uh, the optic groove, uh, greater wing and lesser wing, all right? So <clears throat> again, when we're talking about the, the sphenoid bone, uh, there are a couple of, of uh, projections on the sphenoid bone that are gonna start with PTER, all right? Also, along with that, you've got wings, all right? So you're talking about the big flying dinosaur, all right? Pterodactyl, associate the, that with the wings. What we have on the upper portion is the lesser wing. You're gonna have a tendency to think, okay, greater wing should be superior, should be above, right? But it's not talking about the, the position as much as it's talking about the size. Okay, so lesser wings on top, and then you've got the, the, um, the greater wing on bottom. So this great big blue portion down here is the uh, greater wing as opposed to that smaller portion on top is the lesser wing. Okay, so we talked about the sutures, we talked about those things, that, uh, with the exception of fontanelles, I mentioned that, but you know, the fontanelles are, are the soft spots where the, the skull can collapse as the baby comes through the birth canal. Um, makes it a little easier. <clears throat> All right, so skull morphology, uh, we recognize uh, specific skull shapes. Uh, so we have four different shapes. We have typical skull, which is what we refer to as mesocephalic. Um, I'm just gonna run through these and then I'll, I'll go back through and explain the, you know, the appearance of them. Then we've got brachycephalic. And uh, with brachycephalic skull, what you have is a skull that's, that's more round, it's more shallow appearing from front to back, but it's a more round skull. So with the mesocephalic skull, it's kind of oval. Uh, brachycephalic is more rounded. Uh, dolichocephalic is much more, I said four, but there's only three. Uh, it's much more uh, elongated oval, okay? So with a brachycephalic, what you have is a, a very um, round skull as opposed to being a little bit oval. With a dolichocephalic skull, what it is is very, very oval, okay? It's very narrow, 
and it's deep front to back, but side to side is very narrow. All right. So uh, the uh, the difference between the three and how uh, you know that's going to appear on the inside of the skull is if you're looking at the petrous ridges, and I'm going to back back up to the uh, that. So the petrous ridges are here, right? So when we've got a, a, a brachycephalic skull, what that's going to do is going to push the, the petrous ridges out more at an angle like that, all right? So it's a rounded skull, brachycephalic skull is more rounded, right? So our petrous ridges are going to be more horizontal as opposed to the dolichocephalic skull is going to be more uh, parallel to the long axis of the skull. So we'll get back to this slide here what we're looking at is an average skull is 47 degrees. That angulation is 47 degrees. Whenever uh, we've got a, a true brachycephalic skull, uh, the difference between that's gonna be seven degrees and it's gonna be seven degrees more. It's gonna be more horizontal. It's gonna be getting closer to, uh, you know, 90 degrees, 180 degrees. Uh, so it's a bigger number, as opposed to if we have a narrow skull, it's gonna be seven degrees less. So if you can remember seven, and you can remember 47, then you can kind of put the stuff together and you can kind of do the math in your head, right? So 47 degrees is average, brachycephalic is seven uh, greater than that, dolichocephalic is gonna be seven less than that, okay? So we're not gonna to touch on every single portion of every one of the slides and description of the bone. You can kind of look at the picture and you can kind of figure it out. You know, uh, look at a composite of the, the two images of the frontal bone. Like on page four, you can see it's got a vertical portion, it's got a horizontal portion. You can see the vertical portion in image A, you can see the horizontal portion in image B. It forms a portion of the floor of the, the uh, calvary. Right? All right, so the things to consider, some of which we've already talked about. Uh, frontal eminence, we got the supra, supraorbital margins, that's, you know, above the eyes. Superciliary arches are the, the area directly above the eyes, that's where your eyebrows rest. You got the supraorbital foramen that we've already talked about, and you've got the glabella as well. So all of that. So what you're seeing here is the nasal spine, and that's going to be continuous with the nasal bones, um, and we'll, we'll take a look at that here in a bit. Okay, so frontal squamosa, this image is on there, frontal eminence, superciliary arches, superorbital foramen. Okay, so articulation of all that stuff. There's a lot of articulation between each one of the bones in the skull. Okay, so ethmoid bone, we haven't really looked at. Uh, we'll take a look at it here in a second. We've got the horizontal plate, we've got the vertical plate. We've got the labyrinths, and the labyrinths are, are basically the sinuses. Your ethmoid bone has a lot of them. Um, I think it's anywhere from like four to 15 individual uh, small sinuses inside of the, the ethmoid bone, a lot of them. So it's located between the orbits, and it forms a, a part of the anterior cranial fossa, and the horizontal portion is called the cruciform plate. <clears throat> So we already talked about the crista galli, that's your um, the point all the way up the top, perpendicular plate. We already talked about labyrinth, we already talked about. So it looks like that, kind of looks like a bat, right? So don't confuse this with a sphenoid bone, even though it looks a little like a bat. We're not going to refer to wings on this so much, um, more on the sphenoid bone for that. So we already took a look at this, sticking out of the top of the, the um, um, frontal bone. Right? So what this is, uh, is it, it forms a, a portion of the nasal cavity as well, okay? So uh, we'll get back to that here in a second. So we've got ethmoid sinuses, uh, individual little air cells, and we've got the walls, air cells in the, the labyrinth, um, and then we've got the superior, middle, and then naturally uh, not in this, but rather in the nasal cavity itself, we've got a lower, this word right here uh, kind of refers to the, the type of shells that you see like islanders use for a horn, right? And if you've ever been to Hawaii, which I have not, and you go to one of their um, pig roasts or whatever, they're pro probably going to blow on a shell and make a boom sound, right? That's a conch shell, and that's what that is, is it's uh, 
you know, con conky is plural for conch, right? It's a conch shell. So uh, a couple of different words we're going to use for that. One is turbinates and one is conky or, you know, it's conch. If you've ever seen a PA projection of a skull, you kind of see these little circular looking things that kind of look like what one of those shells would look like if you were to cut it in half. And that's how they get their name is because it kind of has a spiral appearance to it. All right, so <clears throat> superior, middle, and then inferior nasal conchi. Um, I'm just going to call it turbinates because it just rolls off my tongue a whole lot better. Um, and then we've got the perpendicular plate sticking out of the bottom of that. So this is continuous again with the nasal bones. Um, it creates the, the superior portion of what becomes the bony nasal septum. Same bone from the side. So uh, all the same stuff. It's just you don't really see the turbinate squat as well. So the parietal bones. Uh, the parietal bones, I really should put the parietal bones later in the, the um, presentation. The Really the prominent feature of the parietal bones or the most significant thing about the parietal bones to remember is it has nothing real significant about it. It's really pretty, a, pretty much flat bone. Doesn't have many features. You do have this one ridge toward the side, you know, where your head kind of comes up from vertical and it goes a little bit more horizontal, but that's it. That's it. It's just pretty much otherwise flat and smooth. And I'm not saying that in a bad way that, uh, you know, it's insignificant. It's very significant in when we're doing exams, uh, sometimes we'll want to take that parietal bone and project it onto other things because it's featureless and it doesn't, uh, the superimposition is not uh, as, it's easier to see what we need to see through the, the superimposition of parietal bone than something that has a lot of features to it, okay? So that's the only thing of point on the parietal bones. They're kind of square, a rectangular in shape, and that's really the only feature on it. So it looks like that, you know, just not a whole lot there. But the sphenoid bone has a lot of stuff, all right? So it's a regular shape. It's located at the base of the cranium, the anterior portion just posterior to the, uh, to the frontal bone. It consists of a body. You've got two lesser wings. You've got two greater wings, two pterygoid processes. Again, PTER refers specifically to the sphenoid bone and no other bone, okay? So you've got two uh, sinuses most of the time. You can't have just one. And then you've got the cella tersica. That's where the pituitary gland sits. And it's pretty much in the um, mid-sagittal plane and, and directly behind the temple. Well, we already talked about all that stuff in the diagram, so we're gonna kind of skip through that and not hit it again. Clivus, again, that uh, slanted portion on the backside that we use the positioning of the uh, lateral C-spine. So there are a couple of views of this that look a little bit confusing. So this is just as if we took this out of that one diagram where they cut the top of the head off and we're looking down inside of it. So nothing real new on that. Salaturska posterior clinoid process is here anterior clinoid process is there, much more significant. Greater wing, lesser wing, Salaturska. So this one is a little bit confusing, and I, I don't really know why this has made it into every edition of Merrill's, because you look at that, and in, until you really study it, it's hard to figure it out, okay? But what you're looking at is a semi-lateral image of the sphenoid bone. So it's as if we took the skull, we removed everything except for the sphenoid bone, put it in a lateral, and then we just kind of obliqued it a little bit like that. If it was truly lateral, these two would be superimposed, these two would be superimposed, those two would be superimposed, and the wings would be superimposed. So it's a little bit of an oblique view, okay? Um, so these things down here are what we refer to as the pterygoid hamulus or pterygoid process, specifically with the pterygoid uh, hamulus. So pterygoid process uh, project inferiorly from the, the sphenoid bone. And then you've got all the, the other stuff as well. So you've got the anterior clinoids, posterior clinoid, 
you got the clivus, you got the dorsum cell. The dorsum cell is kind of like the upper portion of the clivus uh, and all the you know, other stuff that we already talked about. Okay. So occipital bone is, again, the base of the skull, and it has a few parts as well. You've got squamosa. The squamous portion is, is always going to be kind of that flat portion. you got uh, the occipital condyles, and that's where the head rotates on the spine. So the occipital condyles would be these two things right here. Uh, see these? They kind of blends, so it may be kind of tough for you to see back there, but they project inferiorly so that whenever the head rotates, it rotates on those things. That's occipital condyles. That basilar portion would be the back of the head. So I'm just going to go ahead and pass that around and kind of eyeball it. Or you've got one back there. All right, so a few things on the um, occipital bone of, of importance are the foramen magnum. That's a big hole where the brain stem comes through and eventually becomes spinal cord, right? So occipital. Uh, the external occipital protuberance, we talked about that, that's your inion all the way back on the back. And on the test, I'll take either one, you know, I don't care, uh, shorten it, you know, save yourself some writer's cramp, uh, and just write out inion. All right, so, um, you don't have to necessarily write out the whole thing. All right, so it looks like that. So not a whole lot of features except for those. Uh, it does have a, a horizontal portion and a vertical portion as well. And whenever we have a basilar skull fracture, we'll, what we'll see sometimes is some disarticulations and some fractures that may run all the way down into the um, um, frame of magnet. Again, from a semi-lateral view, so this is kind of like we took the patient's head, removed everything except for the occipital bone, tilted it ever so slightly. The uh, occipital condyles otherwise would be perfectly superimposed and you would not see the foramen magnum if it was a true lateral. So temporal bones again have a lot of stuff. You got a squamous portion, you got a tympanic portion, that's where your um, organs of hearing are. You got a styloid process, we looked at that. You got a zygomatic process. So the zygomatic process, as this thing comes around, what you'll see is a bone that kind of sticks out. And the zygomatic process is what you're looking at. So in that, you've got two different things. The temporal bone has a zygomatic process that reaches forward to articulate with a zygomatic bone to create the zygomatic arch, okay? And that's your cheekbone is what that is. So zygomatic process, um, the petrol uh, mastoid portion is where your organs of hearing are and that's also where your petrous ridges are. Uh, that whole thing is what we refer to as pet petromastoid portion. Petrous ridges, mastoid process is just this big collection of bone and air cells once we get down into the mastoid process. Uh, and that um, you know, gives us that, that appearance, dense bone, but also some uh, air in there as well. We'll take a look at that as well. Okay. So we also have a mandibular fossa, and a mandibular fossa is an indentation on the um, temporal bone where the mandible articulates. Right? You can actually feel where your, your mandible articulates. If you reach up and you put your fingers, kind of mash, don't have to mash very hard, but mash on either side, open and close your mouth. And you can actually feel the articulation, right? And so what's happening there is the mandibular fossa is here and what we get is, is rotation and really a little bit of, of a displacement you know, of the, the uh, mandibular condyle outside of the mandibular fossa. So people have a problem with that sometimes. They develop some arthritis in their TMJ so you may have had somebody say, well, I've got TMJ. Well, everybody has TMJ. What they're referring to is they've got arthritis in their TMJ, right? Sometimes cause some popping and pain and, and whatnot. So that's your temporal mandibular joint. So tympanic portion inside the, the uh, ear, styloid process where we talked about, petromastoid portion where we talked about. 
mastoid portion we already talked about, Petrus ridges uh, we talked about as well. So it looks like that. So we've got the squamous portion, um, and then we've got the mastoid portion that extends all the way down here to the mastoid process, EAM, styloid process, zygomatic process, reaches forward to join up with the zygomatic bone to create your uh, cheekbone. So from the front, it looks like that. You can see how the, the uh, petrous ridges kind of reach around um, inside of the skull. So what you're seeing there, this outline here is supposed to be the orbit, right? So what you're seeing there is where those would be inside of the orbit if the, the patient's skull was positioned as you're seeing here. So um, we'll talk more about that here in a bit, okay? So very important to understand the, the uh, features portion as it relates to the skull, okay? Any questions? So then what we're going to talk about is um, in the skull uh, positioning for different um, body projections or body positions, different body types, you may have to position the patient a little bit different. Right? So let's start with skull topography, skull morph morphology, general body position, cleanliness. Let's start with cleanliness. Right? You're probably not going to do just a, a tremendous number of skulls. Uh, images. All right, so, you know, I'm a little opinionated, right? So, if you have a patient that fell and they hit their head and somebody's concerned about a skull fracture, uh, is a fracture of a skull all that, um, all by itself, is a fracture of a skull uh, important to see? Is it? It's kind of an old gee whiz thing, you know? You, okay, you broke your head. So what's going on underneath, right? So if the patient has fallen and there's a consideration that the patient has any kind of skull or uh, more importantly, brain damage underneath, that patient's going to CT, right? So I, as a result, you're just not gonna see a whole lot of these. Um, it's still on the registry, so we have to cover it. And uh, because we don't see it just a whole lot in clinical practice, pretty consistently, um, the, the questions on the registry, uh, the, the portion of the registry that covers skull bones, uh, people don't do as well because of that, right? But we still have to cover it. So you're not going to see it a whole lot, but, um, you know, you're going to have to be tested on it. So back to cleanliness. If you do have to do some skull work or sinuses or anything like that, uh, make sure of a couple of things. One is that you're gonna put the patient's face and their head directly onto the image receptor, okay? So if I were to ask you to come into an x-ray room where sick people come routinely, and I tell you, put your face right here on this thing, where I may have had a dozen other people you know, in the same day, uh, what's your first thought? Yeah. yeah, how clean is that thing, right? How clean is it? When's the last time they cleaned it? Did they wipe it off after the last patient? How sick was the last patient? A million questions, right? There's one view that we're gonna talk about once we get into the sinuses. We're gonna have the patient open their mouth as wide as they can and mash it directly onto the image receptor. I ain't doing it, not unless I see you wipe that thing down, right? So, would you? So if you wouldn't, then why ask your patient to, right? So what you need to do is you need to wipe down the image receptor and wipe it down in front of the patient. It's not enough just say, yeah, 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 I wiped that down before you got in here. Ever known a liar? Yeah, if you've been alive for two minutes, you've known a liar, right? So wipe it down, wipe it down in front of the patient so they see that, you know, it's clean before you ask them to put their face up against it. All right, so we'll talk, talk about uh, uh, body position, radiation protection will be kind of a, a recurring theme throughout this. So skull topography, what we're gonna talk about is glabella. We already talked about the glabella. 
Um, let me get to the image so that you can kind of follow along. The inner canthus, if you look on page 29, we're on page 29. So the inner canthus is the uh, inner portion of the eyes. If we have an inner canthus, then obviously we're going to have a outer canthus, right? So the outer canthus we're going to refer to a whole lot more than, than the inner canthus. So the nasion is pretty much the bridge of the nose. Um, and the nasion is going to be a point of, of uh, positioning. The infraorbital margin is the bottom of the eye. The cantheon is where the nose attaches to the, the lip, okay? So if you look back at the lateral skull view, or if you happen to have a, one of the skulls with you, you can kind of see where the two maxilla come together. They kind of push out just a little bit, and there's a little bit of a point right there. And that's what we're referring to at the acantheon. All right? So uh, the gonion, um, gonion, yeah, is the angle of the mandible. I lost my mind for a second here. Goinian is a, the angle of the mandible. The mental point, uh, you've seen the, the statue of the thinker, right? It's the naked guy sitting on a rock like this, right? So that's the thinker. Uh, the mental point, you know, is, is where he's got his hand, the mental point. EAM, we've already talked about, uh, top of the ear attachment. Uh, you know, we use that a little bit as well. So, uh, from the front, what we've got is mid-sagittal plane, we've got outer canthus, we've got the nasion, we've got the acantheon, glabella would be right in between the, the eyebrows. Interpupillary line is a line drawn, obviously, just in the word, uh, in between the, the pupils, right across the inner and outer canthus between both eyes. So nasion, acantheon, mental point, uh, the goinian, the infraorbital margin outer canthus over here. Okay? So, <clears throat> lines specific to the skull. So, back on page 29, we've got a number of different lines that we're going to use for positioning. So, the most common, and it's what we're going to refer to as a radiographic baseline, is the orbital meatal line. Okay? So, that's going to be a, a line that runs from the outer canthus out to the EAM. All right, so uh, that's the most common line that we're going to use for positioning. Uh, second most common to that would be the infraorbital meatal line, uh, where the orbital meatal line is a radiographic baseline. The infraorbital meatal line is your radiographic baseline in children because the, the skull in kids are a little bit different than what it is in adults. Um, we have to change our positioning just a little bit. So if orbital meatal line goes from the outer canthus to the EAM, infraorbital meatal line runs from the inferior orbital margin out to the EAM, where do you suppose the glabellum meatal line goes? Yeah, from here out to the EAM. Right, and following with that, uh, a canthal meatal line would go from the nose attachment out to the EAM, um, and the mental meatal line will go from the mental point out to the EAM. So we're going to use each one of those on different projections. Uh, those are going to be parallel or perpendicular to something in most cases. So that's what they look like. Not a whole lot of difference between uh, the, the most common two. So, um, you know, the infraorbital meatal line is also sometimes referred to as the Reed space line. You might not see that in the, the text, but you may see it somewhere, R-E-I-D-S. So Reed's baseline is uh, also the infraorbital meatal line. So we've got the glabello meatal line. You can just kind of see the convergent points. So where does it start and where does it stop? 